chapter 5, verses 12 to 15. And again, uh, these are so few, I'm going to read them myself just. So let's hear uh, God's word. We ask you, brothers, to respect those who labour among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and to esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Be at peace among yourselves. And we urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, Encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with them all. See that no one repays anyone evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. Let's pray together. O Lord, our God, our Rock and our Redeemer, our God, we thank you that you have spoken, Lord. You have revealed yourself to us, O Lord. And our prayer, Father, is that as we spend this short while looking at these few verses just, that your Spirit will be our guide and help us, Lord. That we would learn to be more and more the people that you have saved us to be, your own people, whose behaviour, glorifies you as we reflect the likeness of Jesus Christ. We ask all of this then in his precious name. Amen. Well, last week we were uh, looking at the timing of the Lord's second coming, at the worry of when that day and hour will be. And we said that for the folk at Thessalonica Evangelical Church, Whenever Christ does return, what matters most is, as the Apostle Paul puts it in verse 10, we'll start at verse 9, God has not destined us believers for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. In other words, since the Lord died for us in order that we could live with him forever, it doesn't matter, Paul says, it doesn't matter too much whether we're alive, we're awake, when he returns, or whether we've already died, we've fallen asleep. All of us, you see in chapter 4, verse 17, all of us, all Christians, will be caught up together and will always be with the Lord. When Paul wrote those words in chapter 4, his context there was that he was writing about Christians who had died. Here in chapter 5, he's been writing specifically for Christians still alive. And in both of those contexts, in chapter 4 and here in chapter 5, look at what Paul immediately says after each of them. Chapter 4, verse 18, Therefore encourage one another with these words. Chapter 5 verse 11, therefore encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. Now at the time we didn't say too much about the practice of one anothering. That's a word that maybe you've heard before but I've, I'm using it. One anothering. We haven't looked specifically at that too much when we looked at those verses, but as we move into verse 12 and beyond, it does come up more often. Chap uh, verse 13, be at peace among yourselves, or the NIV says, live in peace with each other. Verse 15, always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. One anothering, that word, that phrase, that terminology, it pops up throughout the New Testament. It pops up to remind us of what the family of God as brothers and sisters ought to do. What it is that we're called to do with or for one another depends obviously on the context. You see in chapter 4 verse 18, chapter 5 verse 11, we're called to encourage one another. That word is one that's often used of the Holy Spirit. He's referred to as the Comforter, the third person of the Trinity 
he, he ministers in such a way to God's people as to comfort us or encourage us. It's the same Greek word. In chapter 5, verse 11, we're called to build one another up. And so in that context there, the, the reference is clearly a, clearly a sort of a, a structural term, building a building, a strengthening something. That's what we're called to do for one another, to build one another up. It's, it's a picture of growth. It's a picture of strong development. The list of other places in the New Testament we were called to do something either to or for one another is quite long. I did a quick search on my software here and there was quite a long list of it. Just from Romans, for example, you'll find we're called to love one another, outdo one another in showing honour, live in harmony with one another, don't pass judgment on one another, welcome one another. Greet one another with a holy kiss. But obviously we wouldn't do that now, would we? Because of this pandemic. But the list is long. And all of it is a corporate activity. One another. In other words, it's not something uh, that only the leaders are expected to do. But each of us as brothers and sisters are to do it as we are able to do it. All of us are called to encourage one another or build up one another, love one another, greet one another, welcome one another. Now how we do that again will depend on the context. You look at chapter 4 verse 18 for example, it then says encourage one another with these words. That's how we are to do it then. In other words, in that context of comforting those whose loved ones had died, we're not to comfort them with sort of frothy sentiments. Uh, not to tell them, for example, that their loved ones have gone and now are stars in the sky that they can see at night or their loved ones who have died are now angels sat on clouds. Those are, those are pointless, frothy sentiments. No, we're to use God's word. We're to use his truth to comfort the bereaved, the worried, the, the brokenhearted. Let God speak words of comfort and encouragement through you as you sit beside your brother or sister, as they hear his words read aloud to them. And again, it's a corporate activity of God's people. This is not something for just the leaders to do or even just the pastor to do. It's a corporate activity. It's one, just one of the one anotherings that we find throughout the New Testament. This week's one anothering concerns the leadership, concerns the relationship between leadership and the congregation, between the under shepherds and those entrusted to them. New Testament church leadership is is what every local assembly of believers would have in place. That's the New Testament church practice to have. It's what you find Paul doing as soon as possible with the early church in Acts chapter 14, verse 23. You see him doing that. When you read in the Old Testament, you see that that was the practice as well. Moses was the leader of the congregation, but within the congregation, there were leaders of each tribe. There were leaders of smaller groups, like groups, uh, leaders of a thousand, leaders of a hundred and so forth. Leadership is needed within any, any organization, but certainly within God's body of people. So when we look here at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, you'll notice there are no titles used. Paul does not say, now you elders, there's no mention of bishops or presbyters or anything like that. But the functions he describes clearly infer that the church at Thessalonica had leaders in place. Quite possibly those leaders included uh, Aristarchus or Secundus. These are men that are specifically mentioned in Acts 20 verse 4. These men came from the church in Thessalonica. But the fact here in chapter 5 that Paul includes this section, it does strongly suggest to us that 
the relationship between the leadership there and the rest of the congregation wasn't great. It suggests that. Why was their relationship not great? Well, possibly the congregation weren't happy with how their leadership were responding to certain situations they had, like how Paul refers to a certain group called the idol in verse 14. These were people we've looked at before, people who had stopped working and now had become dependent on the rest of the church. Maybe the church wasn't impressed by how the leadership there were handling this. Maybe some of them weren't impressed by their leader's ministry in not being able to respond to those whose loved ones had died. Maybe the congregation hadn't appreciated how their leaders were reacting to the sexual immorality happening in the church. We looked at that in chapter 4. We really don't know for sure, but the sense is the working relationship was breaking down. So what does Paul here say in verse 12? What does he ask? Do you see that word, ask? He doesn't command it. He just asks. Now the context there obviously is Thessalonica, but because every church has a congregation and every church should have leadership, the application is even then for us as well. What does Paul say to us? There's a book on leadership that I have read now three times. It's a great book that I will go back to again, I'm sure for a fourth and fifth time maybe. It's a book that's written by Alistair Begg and Derek Prime. It's called On Being a Pastor. On Being a Pastor. And in that book, they describe what to them decent leadership is. It says something like this, doing most things well most of the time. Decent leadership in a church, according to them, would be doing most things well most of of the time. Well, before we look at how the church is to relate to leadership, what does the Apostle Paul describe to us as being decent leadership? Well, first of all, decent leaders are those who work hard. They labour, verse 12, they labour among the church family. Now that word labour, there are two words, that word labour, it's a word that's normally used for sort of hard, sweaty, manual work. The kind of work that someone would use their hands and use their muscles to, to build something or to make something. You wouldn't have thought that a minister or a leader in a church would get sweaty in the study or whatever else they were doing. But actually the, the hard and wearying work of a leader does involve various aspects. Yes, it does involve slogging it out in the study in order for him to prepare lessons and sermons that he will then deliver. And even that delivery of that message, the, the preaching and teaching can certainly leave someone sweaty. Added to that though, the emotional involvement in people's lives, the weight of responsibility for their souls, the particular accountability of leaders for God's flock. Added to that, the constant burden of feeling that you ought to be doing more. And then, of course, there are those in leadership who, who labour nine to five, Monday to Friday, in other occupations to then labour more in the church. Certainly, Paul had shown the leadership there what labour looked like. Chapter 2, verse 9. You remember, brothers and sisters, our labour and toil. We worked night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you while we proclaimed to you the gospel of God. So they labour, they work hard, but they do it also among the people. It's not as though leaders are in a far off castle in a turret somewhere in that castle and from there they labour for the good of the people. Good leadership, decent leadership is working hard amongst the people of God, coming alongside them, 
coming to help them and encourage them as much as they're able to. Working hard among the people of God. But sometimes, of course, they can't be among the people of God. I think of what Paul wrote to the church at Colossae about Epaphras. Epaphras was someone dear to them, someone who had brought the gospel to them, but now was not with them. He was now traveling with Paul, and yet he was still laboring for the church. Colossians 4 verse 12 says, He is also wrestling in prayer for you, that you may stand firm in all the will of God, mature and fully assured. I vouch for him that he is working hard for you and for those in Laodicea and Hierapolis. That kind of conscientious leader, a hard-working leader, is a blessing to the congregation they serve. The second description Paul gives of decent leadership is that they exercise authority, not as lords, but of course as servants. Verse 12, those who labour among you and are over you in the Lord. It's interesting looking at how other translations translate that. Uh, the old NIV uh, translated, translates it like that as the ESV and New King James. They are over you in the Lord. The new translation seems to have become more politically correct and they have given a rather different picture. Those who care for you in the Lord. That is the only translation to put it in that particular way. But this is the word that's there. Leaders labour among the congregation, ministering to them, tending to their needs, but they're also over the congregation in terms of their authority. When we talk about authority in the church, it's always a really delicate issue. This is an, actually a message I wish somebody else would have preached rather than me, but authority in the church, sadly, it often goes to either of two extremes. Either it's heavy-handed where the leader is lording it over the congregation, where the leadership appears more cult-like than Christ-like. Either it goes that way or it goes the other way. It's very weak, very insecure leadership, where actually the leadership there is led by strong personalities within the congregation. They lead the congregation rather than those ordained those installed to be the leaders. When we think of how the Lord Jesus Christ trained the disciples for leadership, more than once he warned them about not leading as the world does, not leading as the rulers or the management of the world do, lording it over their people and flaunting their authority over those under them. Rather, Christ's leaders are foremost servants of the church. In fact, Jesus told his disciples in Matthew 20, verse 27, whoever would be first among you must be your slave. So leaders are over the church. Leaders are there to maintain good order in the church, to to bring that level of discipline that is needed to a church. And yet, as servant leaders, they're also under the church, feeding it and providing for it and protecting it and serving the flock that has been entrusted to them. Decent leadership will do this well most of the time. And all of it, though, is done in the Lord. Do you see that? That's a key phrase that I'm so thankful that Paul included it here. They, they are over the church in the Lord. In other words, they are not exercising their authority in a very cold, forensic way, but with, with the warmth of the Lord himself, with the love that the Lord showed his people. This perfect balance that he showed of strength and gentleness, of authority and humility. 
The third aspect that Paul gives then of decent leadership is that they have a certain backbone, a certain strength of sorts, in that they admonish the church. Uh, the Greek word behind that word admonish, it means to caution. It means to reprove gently those who need it. And you read how Paul does it when he writes to the church at Corinth, 1 Corinthians 4, verse 14. I do not write these things to make you ashamed, but to admonish you as my beloved children. These were people who were going off track, and so out of love for them, Paul writes to them, needing to correct them in the hope of bringing them back on track again. The challenge is always that leaders admonish lovingly and gently, and that they don't lose patience. They, they don't break the bruised reed that we read of from Isaiah earlier. They don't quench the smoking flax, but they, they help the person back. Galatians 6 verse 1, Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Sadly, though, sometimes someone does not respond to a gentle admonishment. And so at times, yes, leaders have to, to move a little further along the journey in discipline. The person hasn't repented. They haven't uh, come back. And so, again, leadership is required to admonish further and further and further. But the fear you see for leadership is, is not to do anything. That out of fear of man or out of fear of being misunderstood, they say nothing. They, they ignore what is clearly seen as, a, as blatant ungodliness or clearly inappropriate or disruptive behaviour. They, they ignore it for the sake of peace. Or, or maybe they got stung the last time they tried to do it and the person left or uh, the person uh, caused division or something like that. And so they back off. They're not going to do that again. Leaders need to admonish. They need to lovingly, patiently reprove and warn someone that they would change their mind, that they would come back and walk in obedience with the Lord again. When leaders in a church lead well like that, not perfectly, because remember, even leaders are fallen creatures too. Even leaders will at times need admonishing and so forth. But, but when leaders lead well in at least these three areas most of the time, then how ought a congregation to respond? How ought the other side of this one anothering relationship pan out in a local church? Well, Paul gives us three further points to work with. First of all, good leaders deserve respect. You see in verse 12, we ask you brothers to respect those who labour among you. On the other hand, or sorry, on, on one hand, we don't want to, to give a decent leadership big heads, but neither do we want to view them as dog's body. I have a friend and when he told me this, I couldn't quite believe it was true, but he, he says that he can remember uh, hearing a, someone pray in a church for their pastor. Lord, keep our pastor humble and we'll keep him poor. That's what they thought of their pastor. Respecting our leaders means we value them. Respecting leadership means we appreciate their worth to the church family. That word respect that Paul uses, it, it means to know. That's all, just to know fully everything about them. That's how the AV, the authorised version puts it, to know them which labour among you. In other words, rather than seeing leaders as people who only appear to work one day a week or when you actually see them, but to recognise them, to appreciate them for the work that they are responsible for. 
Secondly, good leaders deserve affection. Verse 13, we ask you, brothers and sisters, to esteem them very highly in love. There's a minister called John Fawcett. He was the minister of a Baptist church at Hebden Bridge in West Yorkshire. He was there for seven years. And when he received a call in 1772 to a much larger, much more influential church in London, he, he planned to accept their call. Apparently, on the day when he planned to leave Hebden Bridge, the uh, carriage was loaded with all his furniture. He was sat there with his wife and children ready to leave when the congregation came and surrounded the carriage and just stood crying. They just stood weeping at the thought of their minister leaving them. And so John Fawcett changed his mind and turned down the calling to the bigger church in London. And to commemorate his decision to stay there at Hebden Bridge, he wrote that famous hymn, Blessed be the tie that binds our hearts in Christian love. The fellowship of kindred minds foreshadows that above. Before our Father's throne, we pour our fervent prayers. Our fears, our hopes, our aims are one, our comforts and our cares. We share our mutual woes, our mutual burdens bear, and often for each other flows the sympathising tear. That depth of affection is what Paul is asking for in every local church. That congregations would hold their leaders in the highest regard and, and in love. Do you see those two last words that Paul says? What a difference that makes to what he says. In love. No, and not because you like the leader's personality or because you get on with them. But look at what he says. Esteem them very highly in love because of their work. It's the demanding nature of leadership in a local church. The, the amount of work that's often done unnoticed by the majority. But that labour should bring a high level of genuine love and affection, gratitude from each congregation. Recognising that however blessed their congregation may be, to a large part it's because Christ has blessed them with a decent leadership. Well, thirdly and finally then, Paul has one more request, and this isn't for the leadership specifically, and neither is it for the congregation explicitly. This is for all of them, that all of them would be doing this one another, to be at peace among yourselves, or as the NIV puts it, to live at peace with each other. Whatever that strife was that was happening between the leaders and the led at Thessalonica, Paul asks them to live at peace with each other. In other words, both sides are to choose peace over strife. Both sides are to choose harmony over argument, to choose unity over division. For when that happens, when, when both sides, when the whole body there live at peace with each other. They work better together. They serve one another better as one. And Christ is glorified more through it. John Maxwell writes this, coming together is a beginning. Keeping together is progress. Working together is success. Let me finish then with how the writer to the Hebrews describes the benefits of this kind of one anothering. When both the leadership and the local church recognise each other, recognise their responsibilities towards one another and live at peace with each other. He says this, Hebrews 13 verse 17, Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be no advantage to you. Well, let's pray together.